Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome back to the channel. I have got a cold. I've got more tissues. I'm dozing up. Busy day today with content. Uh, extra time tonight, which uh, stay tuned for that because we've got a little bit of an exclusive coming on tonight on extra time as well. We'll tell you about that towards the end. Uh, but our chairman, uh, Mr. Jeff Shee, has dropped a statement this afternoon in regards to uh, the VAR, and in homage to that, I'm wearing the VAR T-shirt. VAR error apology repeat. I'll uh, show you a bit more about that later. And uh, I'm delighted to be joined uh, by Lewis uh, to discuss the uh, the statement uh, from Jeff. Hi, hi, Lewis. How are you? I'm okay, Dave. Um, just disappointed after the decision uh, yesterday, but yeah, I'm all okay. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, obviously, the game, it would have been, I think, a draw probably was a fair result based mm -hmm. on uh, our first half and West Ham's second half. But uh, it wasn't to be. So we shall we, we're going to get stuck into the statement and then we're going to we're going to talk through this, guys. So if you've not seen it, um, we have, uh, you know, it's, it went out on the Wolves website and we've done a, an article on it on the Always Wolves um website as well which i will read to you now if you've not got alwayswolves.co.uk bookmark please make sure you do uh, but basically um jeff she his statement basically goes on to say here's the quote gary our coaching team and all the players have done a fantastic job this season um and hopefully you can see that on the screen have i shared it yet hold on here we go there we go so this is on the alwayswolves.co.uk website. Uh, we've, we've done a spin on it from the uh, the statement on the Wolves website. Uh, and it goes on to say, Gary and the coaching team and all the players have done a fantastic job this season. We're all rightly proud of, especially under the circumstances, with many controversial decisions from match officials affecting the outcome of the games. Um, despite a summer of change and four days preparation, Gary and his staff uh have surpassed last season's points with eight games to go. If it wasn't for the number of incorrect or contentious decisions, we would be further up the table. For other challenges, such as injuries to key attacking players and squad depth, the club can always keep learning and progressing every season. But the standard and consistency of refereeing is something that is out of our control. By that, it means Wolves. When a goal is scored and not one person inside the stadium, questions the validity of that goal, including both sets of players, coaches, fans, and even match officials themselves. He goes on to say it's time to question whether someone remote disallowing that goal is really what football wants or needs. Finally, he said it's our sincere hope that the Premier League and the PGMOL uh, recognise the importance of addressing these concerns to uphold the integrity of the competition and demonstrate why the Premier League is regarded as the best in the world and the club will continue to support our players and coaches to keep pushing hard together with our fans to take on every remaining game with the passion and determination that's made this team a success and one that we're proud to support. Lewis, um, what's your take on that? Um, I think it's good that Jeff's come out. A lot of people have criticised him uh, the past, you know, season, season and a half, for not being as clear as he as he used to be when he arrived at the club. You know, he obviously become a lot more he's become a lot more distant from the fans. I think a lot of people have criticised him for that. But I think to openly come out after such a controversial decision uh, and kind of address his support to Gary and um, uh, support for the team. You know, it's a good thing. I don't think anyone really can criticise him for that. It's something that a lot of people have asked for for a long time from him. Um, I think it shows his commitment to to Wolves still that people have questioned also um, in the past. But yeah, I think for the chairman of a club to come out and actually kind of say what's going on consistently isn't right and it's not you know it's, it's completely wrong. It shows a lot about the situation that we've had over the course of the season with VAR. You know, especially. Um, kind of from maybe September through to December, it felt like every week there was something that um, went against us or, you know, a wrong decision. We got a few apologies kind of in successive weeks, I think. Um, and this this obviously, we had a bit of a break really with VAR making a, a, a bad decision. You know, it, it worked quite well generally. 
Uh, and then yesterday was just ridiculous. The amount of times you see goals scored when a, an attacking player is stood on the goalkeeper. Sometimes even a defensive player is stood in between the attacking player and the, the, the goalkeeper um, to kind of stop the attacking player from, from blocking the goalkeeper. You know, those goals get scored every weekend and they're never really overturned. Um, and I thought what was also interesting was the fact that it was a, a offside goal, um, that the sit was offside, and the referee went over to the monitor, whereas every other offside goal since VAR has kind of been introduced, really, I think, that the referee's never gone to the monitor. So, you know, it's such a unique circumstance. You know what? That's really interesting you should say that, because Emma, obviously our producer, um, she said that literally about an hour ago when we're talking about it she says i've never known um someone that's gone to uh the monitor for an offside decision it's mm -hmm. like it's just it's offside or it's not so um you know the, the, the we are on extra time tonight we will get go more into the uh into the game itself obviously we're here to talk about the the, the statement that is put out um but it's interesting that obviously early season especially we had um we've worked i think they worked out seven maybe nine points we've lost on var let's call it seven yesterday um whether or not we should have been more than one nil up at half time you know if we scored more goals then it doesn't hurt us and we've talked about that before but the fact of the matter is you know we were one nil up uh we were two one down and we got a, a last minute equalizer and um, it's been disallowed. And from what Gary O'Neill, I mean, Gary O'Neill's called it scandalous. He's also confirmed that he's uh, was asked to leave the referee's room. Uh, the assistant manager, is it the assistant manager or assistant or the goalkeeping coach has got um, come out on social? What's his name? Uh, George know. Sean Derry. I think he's got a yellow card. It, yeah, Sean Derry. And um, he's got a yellow card and he basically came out and put a tweet out about saying it's not just a decision, but it's the arrogance of the people afterwards about it. Hmm. The uh, referee and the officials have got vehemently berated and booed as they've come off the uh, the field. I mean, Molyneux, yesterday, I mean, you were there, Lewis. It was, it, you know, some people were losing, really losing their nut, very, very angry over yeah. over that decision. And Gary O'Neill has dealt with it on many occasions, many occasions, talked about it himself, that he's, he, you know, he's talked to the, uh, sent a nice polite message. He, you know, he's sat down and had meetings with Howard Webb a couple of times. He's also, the last time it happened, he got to the point where he just said, you know, well, we just keep getting the apologies, but then it doesn't change. Hence... I've got my VAR T-shirt on today, my VAR error, apology, repeat, because that's been a story of the VAR with Wolves. And I think the fact that Jeff, who is the chairman, who doesn't really court public, uh, come out, you know, generally speak, the fact that it's come to the point that the chairman's made a statement, you know, the top of the club, I think it says a lot about the frustrations within the management team, within the coaching team, within the staff, the players and all of the board and everyone at Wolves that they feel so aggrieved at this point that it's like, well, the chairman's come out with a statement now and um, and come across with that. I think it, some people might be cynical and might say, well, yeah, he's come out with a statement because he wants to get favour with the fans and stuff. I've heard, of, I've seen a few of that. But, you know, you can't, you, you, it's kind of, Jeff Sheets kind of damned if you do and damned if you don't. If he doesn't say anything or he doesn't speak or he doesn't come out, well, where is he and why isn't he talking? And when he does, you get people saying, well, he's just trying to, you know. For me, I think it's a positive thing that the chairman of our club, of our great football club, and, you know, Jeff's made mistakes. We know he has. And I'm sure he does as well. Uh, but we've got a good team, a good manager. We've got, Matt Hobbs seems to be doing a good job as sporting director, but he's, but you, you know, you can't control. And I think Jeff's made an admission about, you know, transfers and stuff that they're going to learn from, which Gary referred to in his last latest press conference. But you can't control the VAR decisions. And, you know, eight points is a lot of points. Yeah. I mean, you look at the table, I'm not sure exactly where we'd be, but 
Um, you know, I'm just getting the table up now. Eight points would take us to 50. We'd be sixth place uh, with two points clear. Obviously, Man United would have the game in hand, but we'd be sixth place. And, you know, obviously that could be the Europa League this season. Um, so that, that, that's, a, that's a huge difference in the type of budget you get to spend, uh, the money you get kind of coming in, the players you can attract to sign. It's a huge difference. And obviously, I, I like that Jeff... Um, you know, admitted that there were things that the club could do better. And, you know, there's things that we can control and there's things that we can't control. And really the things that we can't control should be an equal playing field for all 20 teams in the league. Um, because, you know, you do your job right and everything else will look after itself in an in a ideal world. But, you know, the, the way the, the VAR, it just as it goes on, it looks like it was there to kind of protect um, protect the top teams. And, and uh, I'm not saying obviously West Ham are a, a top team and, you know, it, it's, it's done them a favour, but it, it's definitely keeping teams like us from pushing on into that top six, um, which, you know, 50 points, that's exactly where we would be. Exactly. And to be fair, a lot of West Ham fans have come out and even said they couldn't believe it. I think it was also Fabianski, the keeper, yeah. has said it like, I mean, you know, the, the, the concerning thing for me, and we will talk more about this on Extra Time later and we'll get a deep dive into this, but the concerning thing, thing for me is the goals given, it's like they're looking for a reason not to give that goal to Wolves. And then they go, right, OK, is he in front of the keeper? Yes, he is. Is he in an offside position? Yes, he is. Is he interfering with play? Can the keeper? There's a referee uh, also come out, an old referee that's come out and said it's up to the keeper to move. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at the goal that uh, West Ham scored, um, the, the the freak goal from James mm -hmm. Ward Prowse with the with the yeah. wind assisted, um, but Antonio's backing into Saw. He's back. He's literally exactly backing same. into Saw in the, an offside the, position. The attacking player is, is um, impeding our goalkeeper's ability to reach behind himself and catch the ball. Um, it's exactly the same, Dave. And, and these these um, these incidents happen on virtually every corner. The, the way they set up. Every team will put one player, attacking player, on the goalkeeper to try and restrict him and impede him. And, and sometimes a defensive player will go there to block him. So you'll have the goalkeeper, a defensive player, and then an attacking player. Um, but name one time this has ever happened um, in the same way. And I don't think you can. And I well, think it shows. There's a Man City game the other week that someone else has put on. It was a similar sort of situation. The guy was obstructing, even moved his foot to try and kick the ball, but mm -hmm. it was given. And this yeah. is the frustrating thing. And I think, to me, I wouldn't disallow the uh, the goal that, that West Ham scored on Anto Antonio. People push and mark the keeper all the time to stop him from coming out to punch and stuff. You mm -hmm. know, you played football. Yeah. I played a number 10 position. I love being that person that's in front of the keeper when I played 11 aside, literally standing in front of the keeper to, you know, to block almost. It happens, it's happened, it happens on you know in every league, no matter what level, that's a tactic that's used. And we it's just that's just how it is. No one was complaining about that goal. I don't think the West Ham players were complaining about the Wolves goal. They were like, okay, it's two two. And the referee hasn't done it. But the, the thing that the, the thing that it is, he's gone to the monitor and he hasn't got the strength of his own convictions to go, no, he's not getting that. But they, they put on the screen a still image, a still image of it well, when he's heading, but the ball goes into the bottom corner. The keeper, the keeper's not even going to get there, even if he had the right arms. Yeah. So, I mean, in the chat, um, in the chat, guys, I'm really interested to, to, to see from you guys. That, I mean, there's 122 of you watching this live, I'd like to, to see, first of all, one thumbs up if you, um, just a thumbs up or something or a thumbs down, if you think it's a good thing, a thumbs up, or a bad thing that Wolves chairman Jeff Shee has come out and made a statement. If you think it's a positive thing that he's done that, put a thumbs up. If you think he shouldn't be making a statement, put a thumbs down. And then I'm going to go, um, through some of the comments. If you've got any questions uh, for me and Lewis in regards to that, we can try and uh, and answer those. 
So we just get out. We've got Kevin's going with a thumbs up. Andrew's already going for it. We've got Kevin um, with the thumbs up as well. Let's have a look at some of the comments, uh, Lewis, that we've got going down here. Real state, you cannot be offside from a corner. Well, you can't be offside from a corner when it's kicked because it's a dead ball and everyone's in front of the ball. But when the header comes in, then obviously it's the next phase of play. You know, you can have he's slightly behind. Um, so you know, what else have we got here? Wolves S1 not offside. Kilmanet has reeled out soft cut was in front of Fabianski yet. Yeah. Uh, obstruction, what a complete joke. Uh, but why was the youth player in that position in the first place? Well, a split second later, there was a defender behind him. It's like just at the header. Um, da -da -da -da. <laughs> and the offside or not, we were at a beep second half. Can't argue with that. Um, Neil suggesting again is corruption. And, and, you know, the Wolves fans have had enough in the stadium. They were singing that, weren't they, Lewis? Yeah, and I think what what's so bad with this decision, especially, is um, you know if you, if you think back to the the one against Newcastle at home when Wang gave the penalty away for clearing the ball, I think that that was obviously a foul um, that they decided on, and I think that is a, such a subjective decision. It can be a foul, but it might not be in certain circumstances. But you know, you said at the start, every it's, something is either offside or it's not offside. And for them to, so, so the VAR assistants, they can tell the referee it's offside and that's the decision. You don't need to look at it yourself. But for him to have had to go to the monitor means they're not entirely sure themselves because if it's if it's offside, then it can't be a goal. Um, but for, for them to kind of say, well, you need to have a look at this because we can't make a decision that's 100% either way. I think it just puts doubts in the referee's mind over his own ability. I think, you know, so often, I've, I've watched a lot of football the past couple of weeks and Sometimes there'll be a, a player will go down in the box, and rather than deciding to give a penalty, the referees are just holding back and saying, "Okay, we'll wait, and they'll tell me if it's a penalty or not to save me having to overturn my decision or them them looking wrong." I'll just wait, and if it if it looks you know um, close enough to a penalty, I'll go and have a look at the monitor, and then I'll make my decision. But that's not how football should be played. It should be the referee makes the decision. And VAR just checks it rather than makes the decision for the referee. And, and that's something that Jeff did speak about in the statement. You know, someone remote to the game. They don't understand the same atmosphere, the same the, the way the game's been played. If, if the referees let one go there, you know, you see it all the time in uh, derby games. You know, the referee might just let a, a yellow card go. And then he has to obviously let the next yellow card go. And I, I think um, the way it's been used at the moment is, is not at all what, people signed up for um, and I think that maybe the biggest issue is that the rules you know the, the PGMOL's defense would probably be that in the rules it's offside but you know even Gary said if that if they are the rules they need to be changed because they don't fit for purpose there I think you're absolutely right and I think this is the point that Jeff's been making and think I mean for me um you know I'm just reading through a lot of the comments here and stuff like that for me you know, I think it's really positive that because Gary's spoken up, we've heard, you know, we've seen the assistant managers going nuts about it. Well, I think Hobbs has said something on it as well and got told off, you know, and now it's Jeff that's come out and said, but really, I mean, the positive thing in the statement, aside from the VAR thing, is referred to kind of insinuated about the backing of Gary O'Neill, um, you know, that they're behind the team um that's a positive statement mm -hmm. um and the fact that uh, how well he's done so jeff's come out in that statement as well and if you haven't seen it because i know a few of you said i'll just put it back up on the screen for you now um this is on the alwayswolves.co.uk website so it came out first at on wolves but i will share the uh i will share the statement again for you here so this is on alwayswolves.co.uk statement from wolves chairman jeff Shee. um referring to what it is and this is as emma's put the the main statement again as you can see here he's talking about how well gary and the team and the players have done um and referring to how he's coming in at short notice um but also referring to the incorrect contentious decisions we would be further up in the table um 
the other thing that is which was interesting and referred to and i highlight it there um hopefully you can oh it's not even on the screen again i need to keep doing that i'm highlighting it there for you one of the other things that he's um he's referred to for the other challenges such as injuries to key attacking players or squad depth the club can always keep learning and progressing every season but for the standard and consistency of refereeing is something out of our control uh and then obviously he's gone down to talk about not one person in the stadium questioned the validity and if you were wondering about the uh the bit to gary that's at the top there the positive thing that i'm taking out of that from a statement point of view lewis and i'll give you a thought is that i feel like it's a little bit of jeff holding his hand up mm -hmm. not you know publicly apologizing but holding his hand up a little bit um to to, to say mistake kind of referring to that mistakes have been made in the mm -hmm. past um the the uh the crux of it the acid test the proof of the pudding so to speak lewis will probably be we'll see in this summer how gary is back to his new contract who mm -hmm. they let go and who they bring in would you say that's fair i think everyone can make mistakes dave you know and he will make mistakes again in the future because you know some i think football is such a it's not an exact science you can you could sign the best player um, that everyone agrees would be perfect for Wolves and can come in and it just doesn't work out. And I think that that can happen with sign-ins and things. But, you know, as long as he looks to improve on what he did, um, you know, the, the past couple of seasons, I think people have to be happy with that. I think, you know, no team goes through um, kind of the season without making a mistake. I mean, a lot of people say some clubs are doing really well at the moment. You know, Brighton, for example, a good team, a good example of that, sorry. Uh, you know, everybody's generally feeling that Brighton are doing a fantastic job. They, they're happy with their managers, they're happy with the players they sign. But at the moment, you know, they're only in a good moment, I would say. I think, you know, hopefully for them it will continue. If, you know, if you're a Brighton fan, you want it to continue for as long as you can. But, you know, a couple of mistakes and that could easily, you know, begin to falter and, you know, you start to struggle and you start to ask questions of the, the board themselves there. And um, I think if Jeff, you know, obviously he's come out and he's kind of admitted that there has been things that haven't gone as well as he would have liked this season um but yeah if he comes in out in the summer and there is money for Gary to spend and he gets a new contract then I think you have to look at it and say well he's, he's admitted to a mistake he's made a mistake he's admitted to it but he's gone to rectify the situation and you know and then and then you see how you get on next season really yeah I think that's the I think that's going to be the acid test this season with everything that's happened with FFP and all that sort of stuff um obviously big Big spending was done in the past. We talk about silver. We look at Geddes and the losses that we're going to make on those. Obviously, you know, early days under Mendes was really good. The latter signings not so good. Some of the best signings we've had in five to fifteen million. I think it's going to be very, very interesting. There's a question here uh, which I saw. Someone who definitely wants to be heard. Um, I'm just reading down it now, which I'll put on it. You don't need to shout for our attention, but. Tom said, do you guys reckon we'll spend big in the summer? I would love to see three or four signings of intent. What's your thoughts on that, Lewis? Um, I think it depends on what you mean by spending big. You know, you spoke about there, the, the Geddes uh, deal, the Fabio Silva deal. They were kind of big statement signings for the club and both of those players didn't really work out. I, you know, I would prefer, um, you know, kind of players who are going to add quality no matter what the price is. And that could be done through really good scouting, you know, like similar to, you know, obviously I know Gomez was quite a big fee around 15 or 16 million. I 15 think. million pounds isn't that big a fee in the scheme of things. He's probably yeah, worth it is that million, though. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, that's what I mean. You know, this kind of deal is, is something, you know, I prefer. It's, low, right? it's much more lower risk. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's, um, you know, with the Gwedis deal, especially with his age as well, it had to work out for him here um, because, you know, it, maybe with Fabio he had the advantage of he can still develop to be a, a much better player it's looking unlikely that he'll do that in England um but he you know when he went on loan to Eidenhoven and Anderlecht he looked like a really good player um so I think yeah this kind of deal is something I, I would prefer a lot um but I think we definitely need depth and you know I would imagine that the scenario for Gary will be that the board give him maybe 30 million pounds and then they say you'll get 80 percent of whatever we make in transfer sales so obviously 30 million is not a huge amount but it is looking like uh we, we're going to sell a few players 
And 80% is quite a big portion, especially if you're selling players like Neto for maybe 40 or 50 million upwards. Um, at Nuri too, obviously that they're big losses to lose in the squad. But you know, you, you have a lot of money there to go and reinvest. I think that would be the perfect um, situation financially for me. Do you think, um, though, that you know, Ait Nori personally is one I wouldn't want to sell. You know, Neto, we love Neto, but like he's only on the pitch half the time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Neto in full full form is an eighty million pound player, but with the injuries, it might drop his value a bit. Um, you know, I, 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 do you think the Wolves fans would accept selling more than one of our star assets this year? Yeah, and I think that the. The tough thing about this is, Dave, at the moment, um, the players are really motivated. You know, Aitno will be really motivated to play consistently, you know, for the club as well. But he'll also be aware that there's interest in him and he'll be motivated to play well because of that interest. And I think if there was offers there and the club were unreasonable, it could be easily, you know, you could easily upset the player. And then the player, the Aitno you get next season, if you don't allow him to go and there was interest, is not the same Aitno that you had this, this season. Um, and that that'd be a big shame to miss out on that opportunity for the club. I think, you know, the Aitnuri we have at the moment is a really special one. But you know, if the summer you know goes the way you know I expect it to, and there is offer and that there are offers and there is interest, and you don't let kind of kind of explore that in, into it uh, to the full extent, um, you you might not have the same Aitnuri, and that would be more damaging to the squad than taking some money and reinvesting it on two two players. Okay, then. We're just coming up towards the last five minutes of this uh, statement. Um, Ait Norrie, you're sporting director of Wolves. I don't see why you can't be one day. You're, you, you know, it's an aspiration of yours to of something that you've got a real interest in. And you, I know you do a lot of um, following on players around Europe and stuff like that. You do a lot of uh, research and analysing and all these sort of things. But Ait Norrie, for you, if you're Wolves chair and Wolves sporting director, what's the price tag you put it on his head? Um, it's high, but it's restricted slightly because he plays as a defender. But you know, we have seen him deployed a lot further up the pitch recently. I think he's capable of that. Um, he's such a you know capable, uh, technically technically capable player. He can keep the ball so well. Um, so I would have to say it'd be upwards of 60, 60 million if he was consistently played between now and the end of the season as an attacking player and made consistent uh, goal involvements, I would say upwards of that, though, maybe 70, 75. Because and, net and Neto for you? Yeah, I think Neto is um, it's a slightly different one. Like you said, on his day, he is an £80 million player to us because of his contract situation as well. Um, but clubs will look at the injury and say, well, you know, we, we can't really justify that money on someone who's only going to be available for 50% of the season. But there are teams, you know, for example, I look at Arsenal and the way they may see it is we don't need him 100% of the time. It, you know, they would offer less because of his injuries, but they're, they're in a position where they don't need him available every game for, you know, every minute of every game. So it, it could be for them, they're not really put off by the injury situation because they have other players with such good quality. Um, that, that would allow Neto to be to be missing for some games. There's a good good point here from Dan Evans. Doesn't Angers have a hefty cut of it? Uh, how much did we pay for uh, eight or Do you know, can you remember? I can't remember, Dave. I'll have a quick look. Yeah, because I think Dan Evans was say, is saying there. I think there's a fifty percent sell on up into up to around about a ten million pound value, but Wolves can. Buy out that buy out that for ten million or something like that. Yeah, so it says nine point eight million. We signed him for on a five year deal with an option for a further year in July twenty twenty one. So um, basically, he's contracted to Wolves till twenty twenty seven. Yeah. So again, it puts the club in a really good position with the players' contracts because they're not they're not under pressure to sell at a cheap price in in fear of losing him for free. Um, and I think obviously you spoke about the the, the, the sell-on clause that Angers might have. Obviously, if the sell-on clause um, kind of buyout clause of that is worth um, less than any money they would get, the club would just pay that. So say we sold them for 70 million and they would be entitled to 35. Well, Jeff would probably just pay the 10 million and keep well, it. Well, it would make sense. But th yeah. there's a prime example there of a player that we bought for 9.8 million 
who's, you know, some people re re to re referring to him as the Wolves Messi. He's that skillful. And now we're talking about a player that's 60, 70 million. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, this, uh, and this is a player as well that was bombed out by Lopetegui last year that couldn't even get in the squad that people thought he'd go in the summer. And now we're talking under Gary O'Neill, he's reinvigorated and we're talking 60, 70 million and we bought him for 9.8. This is about, this is what we're talking about when we're talking about trading players and stuff like that. But to me, I wouldn't want to sell Ryan out Neary because I think he's got more to come mm -hmm. and he's only going to, he, he's on, still on a long-term contract and, you know, you know, he's, I wouldn't want to sell him for anything less than 70 million personally, yeah. but like someone comes in with 70 million, it's hard to turn that down, isn't it? Yeah, and, and the players, you know, they, they will look at Champions League football, they'll look at the big clubs and say, ultimately, that, that they are their aspirations. And, you know, you have to be you have to treat players well, you know, that they've done a good job for us, I know, especially this season. Um, and, and you have to have that agreement. And it could, you know, if, you, if you're a, such a reluctant club to sell players, it might put other players off joining you who would, you know, follow a similar path to it. They might look at Wolves and say, well, Look how harshly they treated him in the end, and they didn't let him go. It was so awkward. It, it might put players off joining um, joining Wolves, and I think it, it's a similar thing to again. I, I spoke earlier about Brighton. Um, it's a similar model, model that Wolves used to have. They'd sign a player for quite cheap, you know, obviously eight million, nine point eight million, with the view of selling them on for a, a lot more than that, and it works. And, and everyone seems to be okay with it. At Brighton. I saw a few comments saying that. You know, it's better to keep the the better players, and it is. But you have to be a top club to be able to do that. Ultimately, you have to sell in the position we're in um, at the moment. We have to sell out our better players um, for profit to then reinvest that money on slightly better players and gradually build ourselves up. That is the the kind of the best way to do it. And I think Brighton are an example of that, given how they've done it. But also, it, could, it can also could fall apart slightly, as we have experienced in the past couple of years. Um, how do you answer this, Lewis? L lack of ambition puts some up, some offers. Do you think Wolves are a team that lacks ambition? Um, no, I wouldn't say. So you look at the signings we've made. I don't think it's, uh, it shows the club that lack ambition. Um, you know, we, we spent fifty million pound on one striker last January. Which what about Matthias Kuna? Yeah, it's easy to forget that that's a statement signing when we're in trouble. You know, a lack of ambition would be signing someone like uh, Josh Brownell, which I saw linked in the summer. I'm not saying it would be a bad player for squad depth, but if we had signed him instead of Cunha um, in that window and said those type of players, I think that shows the lack of ambition because it's almost like you're preparing for the championship with the view of coming back up. We we, we showed that we wanted to stay in the league last, uh, last winter. Um, and again, I know obviously uh, we didn't invest as heavily in the, in the summer window, but with good reason you know as it's kind of shown the past few months with nottingham forest and everton getting their point deductions you know we, you know we've obviously missed out on seven or eight points because of var imagine if the league were taking points off us for overspending you know we'd be in a much worse position then um so yeah i don't think it shows no ambition absolutely um guys just last five minutes if you've got any quick questions before we finish whilst we've got lewis on the other thing is if you uh you know, want to do more of these sort of videos where I sit down with Lewis because Lewis is someone that is incredibly knowledgeable uh, on world football and players and stuff like that. If you'd like to see some discussion about potential signings and options and that type of thing or who we should keep and get rid of in the summer, those type of things, uh, let me know in the comment section. I'm sure that's something you'd be interested in getting involved with, Lewis. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it was something, uh, yeah, definitely interested there. You've got a lot of not knowledge. And a couple of you have asked about the T-shirt. There it is. Emma did this. VAR, error, apology, repeat. Dragged it out today. If you if you want one of them, um, it, it supports the channel for one, but it's also pretty cool. To, I know quite a few have already got these. And uh, when, when we were having all this, this stuff and Emma decided to put it together, the link is in the uh, is in the description um, for you. Um, our ambition, Joe says, has got us nearly in touch water with FFP. We have ambition, just not look VAR and industries. We would be in Europe if they hadn't been a factor. Adrian Richards says, uh, bang on, uh, Lewis. Uh, Steve wants to know if you're on social media anywhere. You're not, are you on X? Uh, no, no, you just do the Instagram, don't you? 
Yeah. Uh, Carl says, um, keep keep the videos going with Lewis. He quite likes them. So that's good. Oh, oh yeah, Ildon. Adrian Webb, at least one of us on this topic, discussion with Lewis and lots of uh, lots of tips. <laughs> yeah. So that's good. Because I think it is quite good because, like, you know, we do our research and stuff like that. But, you know, it's nice to have some people that have got real, you know, knowledge and depth on this sort of stuff. And that's why I asked uh, Lewis to come on, on with this. Uh, just getting back to the Jeff C statement again uh, before we finish, Lewis. Mm -hmm. um, how would you conclude that? Um, how would you conclude it? To just yeah, I'll go back to kind of what I said at the start, Dave. A lot of people criticised him for being a bit more distant than he has been since he start, you know, first arrived. I think this is um, coming out and supporting the club, supporting the team. It's only a positive. I don't know how he could be criticised for that. Because, like you said, if he didn't come out and make a statement, um, at least once this season with the amount of errors VAR's had uh, against us, you know, people were criticising for that as well. So I think it's a, only a positive for me. Um, I think it's good that he's kind of recognised his own and the club's um, mistakes, but also kind of committed to a um, to, to a policy of changing that moving forward and, and just kind of coming out supporting Gary is the best thing he could have done because we have a real good manager here again for the first time, I think, since Nuno left. Um, it's kind of this is the one that's worked. Um, well, at the most, and you know, we don't want to lose him because it's it's hard to find managers. You know, that they they went after two, obviously a younger kind of newer manager in Bruno, and more experienced quality manager in Judah. And for the first time, we we look like a club who will move forward. You know, we'll, be, we'll start to make those forward steps again. Absolutely, uh, Carl says forty one likes on the video. Let's get it up to a hundred, guys. Hit the smash like button. Um, yeah. I mean, North Street again, we do know that he's, uh, he's, he's a little bit anti. He says, if someone gets 60 million, do you think we'll spend it? He don't. I think they will. I think, I I, I mean, I'm, you know, I am a half glass full person, me. You know, sometimes a happy claffer type of thing. I get angry about things and upset about things. But I do think, personally, that this summer is going to be such a, a big summer. And, I, you know, I, I could want to keep my powder dry. Because I've all along believed that if we can get through this year and we can get to this summer, there's going to be a bit of clear blue water. Matt Hobbs hasn't done a bad job. I think Jeff, you know, is I think he realises that mistakes have been made. I mean, obviously the pandemic, the things that have happened. I think he's referred to that in the stuff. We had such a bad summer publicly. He spat with Lopetegui and Discord with the fan base and everything last year. So much division. I think it's really incumbent on the board, on Matt Hobbs, on Gary, on Jeff, all to be on the same page and make sure that Gary gets his new contract. I think he's earned, he's earned it. I think Gary O'Neill is happy at Wolves. I think he's got a real bond with the players. I don't think Gary... I've, I've seen people saying, oh, he's going to go to West Ham, he's going to go here. And it's like, why would he do that? You know, mm -hmm. it'll just become a person that jumps from club to club every year. I don't think Gary O'Neill wants that reputation. Well, I was at Bournemouth, now I'm at Wolves, the year after I'm at West Ham. I think he wants to settle for two or three years and prove that he can grow and build a club because ultimately for his career, he's still a young manager in the long term. That's going to be good if he you know, wants to eventually go and manage you know, a real big top six club or manage you know, a top team in Europe or even go on to becoming a future England manager, you're not going to do that from hopping and changing. And the job he did at Bournemouth, then he's going to do a great job in the first year with Wolves. And then he starts again at another club the following year with brand new players again. And he's back to square one again. Why would he want to do that? And but he needs to be backed. There's a, I see a lot of, obviously, about West Ham, Dave, you know, links with West Ham. Um, because, obviously, he used to play there. And, you know, there's personal links from living, you know, his family are still in London. Um but for me, from what I can see of the situation, West Ham owners are really happy with David Moyes. It's only the fans who are not happy. And Which is bizarre. He's yeah. won a European trophy. They're in the quarterfinals of the Europa League. They're, you know, pushing Europe again this year. OK, had they have drawn the game, we'd have been three points behind them, you know, and all, all of that. It, it's, it's bizarre. But I think it's because they perceive him to play very negative football and he just sits mm. back and that's... But, you know, be careful what you wish for. Yeah, People wish for Nuno to go. Yeah, exactly. Look what I'm happened quite, then. 
quite confident Gary won't go to West Ham because you know the fans don't pick who is the manager. It's, it's the board, and, and they're happy. And um, yeah, it's whether he decides to stay at the end of the year. He's also said it's whether it's right for him. So he might go himself. He might be sick of it and just go. You know what? See ya. I think that is it will be interesting to see the order um, things happen. You know, will Gary sign the contract? Um, you know, right at the start of the summer, then start signing players, or will the club have to kind of show him um, their commitment to him by bringing in players that he wants, protecting players he wants to protect in, and then sign the contract? I think that's going to be a really interesting thing because then, you know, if um, the club start start signing Gary O'Neill players. Um, but then he kind of says, well, this isn't exactly what I want. I want a bit more. And then he leaves. Well, then the club's in a very interesting position of, well, you have players that the new manager coming in might not even want uh, and you've just signed them. So I think the club are keen to obviously get that contract sorted soon and then start building around him. But, you know, I don't see Gary as a bad faith person. I think he'd be quite open with the club and say, look, this is what I want. If you can promise that to me, I'll sign the contract. If, if, you, if you can't, then maybe it's time to kind of call the relationship to an end. Absolutely well said. And, you know, we're just finishing off this thing. I hope you've really enjoyed it. If you have, as I say, smash that like. If you're brand new, so hit the subscribe button. We have got uh, extra time tonight where we will be deep diving. It's a fan's phone in. If you want to get on the show, uh, all you need to do is message the Always Wolves Instagram, Always Wolves Facebook page, uh, drop us a message. And if you want to get on the show to talk about uh, where we are as, as a team, talk about the game, talk about the VAR decision. I can exclusively reveal uh, to you guys that tonight, as part of the fans phone in, we will be joined by Sky's Johnny Phillips live on the show. He will be joining us this evening to talk about the game. He was there yesterday. He also interviewed Gary O'Neill after the game. So make sure you've got that subscribe button hit. You've hit the bell notifications. We will be live on extra time tonight from 20 past eight. As I say, we will be joined by Sky's Johnny Phillips, and I'm sure it'll be interesting to get his take on on that as well. As I say, if you want to get on to the show to join, uh, just get in touch with us and we'll get you on there. It is a fan's phone in. We welcome views from, you know, all sides of the spectrum. Um, Lewis, thank you ever so much uh, for coming on this afternoon. We will do more of these sort of videos with Lewis. Uh, that a load of people have said they really enjoyed it. Uh, if you're watching it on catch up, put it in the link in the description below, and we'll try and get this out on to uh podcast as well. And finally, AH here, well spoken, Lewis Lad. I think that's a nice way to uh to sum it up. Thanks ever so much for joining us, and we'll see you live on extra time tonight at 20 past eight. Uh, from myself and Lewis, until the next one. Always Wolves. Always Wolves. Cheers, Dave.